Hello everyone and welcome to the conversation. We are so glad to have you here today. My name is Jared Head. I'm going to be your host for today's Tomorrow Space episode. And next to me, I have our resident non-normie Jade. How's it going, Jade? Hi. <laughs> Pretty good? Hello. And of course, to my other side over here, I have our rocket specialist, Mike. How's it going, Mike? Pretty good. How you doing today? Pretty nice good. To and then behind us, producing the show, is Dada. Right there, who I'm not going to say anything to because he doesn't speak. And a <laughs> photobombing Lisa in the background as well. Now, today in the news... We have microbes that could survive on Enceladus. An international interest in the lunar gateway is growing. And we've got Lisa right there doing the interview with Neve Shaw, talking a little bit about arts and humanities in space. And of course, we take a look at your comments and questions from last week's show. So stay tuned. This is tomorrow, Orbit 11.11. .11. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? And of course, right out at the top of the show, we want to thank our Escape Velocity citizens. These folks give us $10 per episode on Patreon or $30 a month or more on makersupport.com. And they get a lot of good stuff. Like you can actually get access to the rundowns that we look at uh, and you know see all the jokes that Jade uh, has written down for all of our <laughs> episodes uh, that we've got right here. So if you'd like to help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, uh, you can head on over to Patreon patreon.com slash tmro or makersupport.com slash tmro and every little bit helps without you guys we can't do this show and that's why we're ever thankful for you and your support yeah, so, so much. let's go ahead and get this started we're going to throw it over to mike because mike you got one launch to talk about this week uh and it yeah, just yeah. happened and we're gonna okay. we're gonna get this going so mike go ahead and tell us about this launch that just now happened yeah, we weren't expecting any launches uh, this week, but just as you said, uh, there was a launch early this morning from China, in fact. And uh, I'll, I'll, unfortunately, with this particular mission, it's another one of their land surveys, so there's not a whole lot of media for it. However, uh, the launch did take place at 7.10 Coordinated Universal Time earlier this morning, and it was a Long March 2D rocket launching from the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center. Now, the payload for it was the fourth satellite in the Ludicancha Weijing series also known as land surveying satellites, otherwise known as LKW number four. And uh, the footage that you're seeing is actually from the uh, launch of LKW number one. And as per usual for the Chinese media, this spacecraft is once again classed as a new remote sensing satellite that's going to be used for remote sensing exploration of land resources here on Earth. However, it's very much suspected to be a military purpose uh, satellite. The previous satellites of the series were the LKW one, which was launched on December 2nd of 2017, LKW two, which was launched on December 23rd of 2017, and LKW-3, which launched on January 13th of this year. All of those satellites were uh, launched by a Long March 2D rocket and launched from the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center. So, surprise launch this morning. We, uh, as always, <laughs> finally have a launch to talk about every week, so I'm actually kind of happy about that. Yeah, thanks, China. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll eventually get some footage of that on Twitter from somebody's cell phone uh, in vertical video, of course, um, <laughs> because that's the way it goes. But there you go. You're, you're one launch, so I guess our streak is still continuing this year with launches. Every episode, have we had? I don't think we've had an episode without a launch so far this year. So I don't think so. Not, so, not yet this year. So. Yeah, China Ooh. coming in just a few hours before with it there. Now we're going to switch gears and we're going to go out to the outer solar system to a cold, far away. Yeah, hit the clutch as hard as you can. Dada can help you with that. Uh, now <laughs> we've got microbes. And they can survive on places that we weren't expecting microbes to survive. Is that am I that, reading this that correct? That is correct, so, Senor Cabeza. On enchiladas, or no, Enceladus. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. So tell us a little bit about this, Jade. So scientists have recently discovered a microbe that could mimic life potentially existing on Enceladus as we speak. 
Uh, recent findings in the journal Nature report that a certain type of microbe called Methanomercoccus okinawensis, yes, I practiced that, Dang. has been found to survive the intense conditions of Saturn's icy moon Enceladus. This microbe, known as an archaeon, is an extremophile native to the deep sea and uh, native to the deep sea hydrothermal vents in the Okinawa Trough of Japan. And of course, extremophiles are organisms whom have adapted and thrived in extreme <gasps> environments, like our favorite tardigrades. friend, the tardigrades. So the water cute. bear, Hi. the moss piglet, the <laughs> cutest thing ever. Enceladus has been one of the more popular <laughs> candidates for life in our solar system's backyard, especially after NASA's Cassini mission detected methane in the water geysers that shoot from its surface. And this methane could possibly be of biological origin, according to Dr. Simon Rittman, one of the study's authors. So, similar to Jupiter's moon Europa, Enceladus is enclosed in an icy outer shell with a subsurface salty liquid ocean underneath. Scientists believe that there may be hydrothermal vents on Enceladus's ocean floor, similar to ones we have here on Earth, that could supply potential life forms with food and energy through a process called chemosynthesis, or the consumption of chemicals emanating from the ocean's floor. Mmm, mm, tasty. Delicious. Yummy. <laughs> the study, led by researchers from the University of Vienna, took three different types of microbes and subjected them to the intense pressures and extreme temperatures that organisms would have to endure on Enceladus. Poor things. <laughs> M. Oki, as I'm going to call it, was the sole survivor. And not only that, but it also ended up producing methane. These are all good signs for finding life on Enceladus or other icy bodies beyond Earth. But again, much more research needs to be done before any conclusions are made. And it's important to note that conditions in the lab obviously may not fully mirror the actual environment of Enceladus. Plus, a future mission to Enceladus would actually have to have a much more advanced mass spectrometer than the one we sent out on Cassini if we're looking to detect some more potential biosignatures. Um, and I'll just end that with, you know what, if there is life on Enceladus, we would have to take extra caution to avoid any potential contamination um, as to avoid false readings or worse, threats to an already pre-existing ecosystem. Because what a bummer would that be mm -hmm. if we go and it's like, oh my gosh, there's a beautiful ecosystem here. Oh my gosh, we accidentally completely ruined it with germs from Earth. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, that's uh, that's one of the reasons why Cassini was disposed of the way it was yes. uh, in late 2017 was because rest in peace. it this was, is. yeah, rest in peace Cassini. Um, we'll never forget you. Um, but, you know, uh, it was disposed of the specific way it was in the Saturn's atmosphere because of the fact that um, Cassini was not built to the specifications of cleanliness like mm -hmm. Mars missions are mm -hmm. because we didn't know that there were all these habitable places out in the Saturnian <laughs> system uh, at the time when Cassini was designed and built in the 90s and then launched in 1997. So, uh, so that was uh, a very, that was probably one of the biggest uh, surprises and one of the best discoveries that Cassini did, which is that uh, that uh, these icy worlds that seem to have oceans underneath their surfaces actually yeah. could be potential harbingers of life. And the cool thing about uh, our solar system is that there are a ton of these icy yeah. worlds and there are uh, quite a few of them that likely have oceans underneath that ice. So it turns yeah. out exposed oceans like what you have here on Earth are the rarity, not mm -hmm. not uh, oceans underneath ice being the rarity. So we're actually really weird here on Earth because we can access our oceans. That's one easy. reason we're weird. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, amongst the multitude uh, with our non-normie jade. Now. <laughs> Um, we're going to move back to Earth because there is uh, some politics that's happening um, at the moment with NASA, which for those of you who say, get politics out of my space flight, uh, you should probably <laughs> find out why space flight was started in the first place. Um, so we're going to head on over to Mike, and you're going to tell us a little bit uh, about a retirement and a stalling happening at NASA currently. Yeah, and with this, uh, NASA could be leaderless for a little while. What we're talking about is right now the current acting administrator of NASA is Robert Lightfoot, and he has announced that he is retiring from the position of, of – he's retiring from NASA, period, but especially from the position of acting administrator. He's a rocket propulsion engineer and a civil servant who has led the administration since the beginning of the Trump administration. Um, he took office in January 20th of 2017. And even though he's a 29-year veteran of the space agency and has served, you know, done a phenomenal job, in my opinion, ever since uh, Charlie Bolden left the job at, at the end of the Obama administration, uh, all of this comes as a little bit of surprise because President Trump's nomination to become NASA administrator, Representative Jim Bridenstein from Oklahoma, um, even though he was advanced through the Senate Commerce Committee, um, <laughs> 
they have not been able to uh, c- continue the vote, and they've ne- not been able to push through his nomination to take office. And the White House resubmitted Bridenstine's nomination in January of this year, but the full Senate meeting has again yet to vote on his confirmation. And SpaceNews.com reported on Monday that there is a pretty widespread belief in the space industry that the Senate has not voted on Bridenstine because he lacks enough support for pro- for confirmation. All of the House Democrats are expected to vote against him. And there's at least two senators that are on the Republican side that are planning on voting against him, as well as John McCain, who isn't even in uh, the Senate right now and can't vote for this because he's being treated for cancer right now. So he's just not going to get enough votes as it stands right now in order to be pushed through. And with Bridenstine's nomination in limbo, Lightfoot has held the acting administrator post for almost 14 months, which is longer than anyone else in NASA history. However, meanwhile, the Trump administration's nomination for NASA's chief financial officer, whose name is Jeffrey DeWitt, he's the Arizona state treasurer, he was confirmed on March 14th by the U.S. Senate for the position of the chief financial officer of NASA. And he's expected to resign as Arizona state treasurer and start work at NASA in the next few weeks. So I had to throw that in there because uh, he's a local guy that I know. So uh, I think that that's really cool. But it's also a bit concerning, though. Uh, something that I did want to mention is that Robert Lightfoot said that even though he's going to be stepping down at the end of April, He's very really confident that NASA is going to be able to continue on without any firm leadership in place and that all of the different procedures and pretty much the way that NASA has been operating uh, since last year is going to continue on until this can get sorted out. But mm-hmm. uh, since uh, all this is, is going on, and even though I don't have any civil servant experience, I would like to uh, throw in my candidacy for that. So, yeah, I think you'd be a great <laughs> administrator. Mike NASA administrator. Let's <laughs> yeah. make it you got happen. two votes right here. Yeah, exactly. You got right. two. So you need <laughs> How many do you need? 51, I think? Uh, one, two, yeah, three, 51. Four, five. Call okay. up your uh, got five local, here at least. Uh, representatives, call up your senators, let them know that there's a, uh, a wild card out there. Okay, we <laughs> definitely will. Uh, you know, wild, wild cards are always one of my favorite things uh, to throw out there. Um, so you've got five votes here. We just need to get 46 more from uh, the Senate, I suppose, Make it um, happen. in order to get to it. Um, so, yeah, just, I guess, continuing the theme of things um, with it there. And I hope that they, they can figure out something. And, you know, Lightfoot said that, you know, it's going to continue. It's still going to work the way it is even if he's not there and there's no technical administrator leading things so I'm not too concerned about it but it definitely is uh, uh, a, it would be the first time in NASA's history that they technically don't have a leader in a leadership position so um, we'll have to see how that works American government is kind of yeah. interesting since I know we have a very big international audience if you ever want to uh, find yourself a textbook and you can get just as, co- as confused as we are <laughs> so um, <laughs> You, we're going to throw it back to Jade because you got, uh, you, you got, uh, I mean, it is a month after Valentine's Day. I got but some you juicy got, news. You do have some juicy news yeah. about, about uh, was it SO-2? Uh, yeah, S2. Or S2, excuse me. Uh, yeah. um, mm-hmm. So S2, uh, which is a star in your Sagittarius A, is single and ready to mingle mm-hmm. with our wow. super massive black hole that is. <laughs> um, astronomers have been waiting for the green light to use this young hot star, which is 15 times more more massive than our own sun as a subject for an exciting test of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Until recently, um, S2 was thought to be orbiting another star in a binary system, which would have made the upcoming gravity test a lot more complicated. However, astronomers led by Devin Shu of UCLA, known as the Galactic Center Group, discovered using the Keck Observatory on Mauna Kea that S2 is indeed flying solo. Or at least if it does have a partner, it would be insignificant to the measurements. And they figured this out by analyzing the light spectra of several stars and screening for any deviations a companion star might have on S2's light, of which there were none. So uh, you might be asking, well, why are we even testing Einstein's theory of general relativity? I thought it's been proven over and over again. Well, kind of. The gravity test is going to measure a key component of the theory, which predicts that light emanating from a strong gravitational field um, will get redshifted, a.k.a. stretched out. S2 makes its closest approach to Sagittarius A in the spring, allowing researchers to directly measure its redshift as it undergoes maximum gravitational pull from our supermassive black hole. I just really like saying that. Um, Because (laughs) gravity will be strongest at this point, any discrepancies at all between theory and observation will become most apparent here. 
Uh, and gravity, of course, being the least tested of the four fundamental forces of nature, will uh, be measured in an unprecedented rendezvous between a black hole and a very proximate star right by it. <clears throat> And of course, they're also going to use this data to study other stars in S2's neighborhood um, because it's, it's actually a little bit unusual that stars of this caliber are able to form and kind of just orbit in this very hostile environment. Mm -hmm. So a lot of amazing data is going to come out of it. So I'd like to congratulate the Galactic Center Group and of course, Devin Shu. Uh, this is awesome. And we will look forward to those results when they do those observations. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that. UCLA here in the Los Angeles area has kind of been a hotbed of activity for black holes uh, for the past two decades. So it's mm -hmm. been amazing watching the work come out, um, especially what they're doing with Keck up in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm super excited for that data to come out, especially because every time we've tested uh, the theories of relativity, they've worked exactly as predicted. There has literally never been a test in the near century insane. of its existence that tells us that it doesn't actually it's work. Bonkers. Yeah, it's that so doesn't cool. that's like and you know, this was coming from the mind of Einstein. You know, he didn't have computers at that right? time. They didn't or even have Nintendo back then. Like, yeah. And like, he's able to figure that out about the center of our I mean, come on. That's what's so amazing about it to me is that it's been around for over a century and it's never been disproven. Every time we've tested it, it's like Bam, right, right within five sigma of where we need it at. Ridiculous kind of stuff. Um, and I'm gonna go back over to you, Mike, because you actually are gonna talk about something that I know you're super passionate about um, and you're super excited about. And I actually read an article on NASA Spaceflight this week about it, and I'm now super excited about it because of what's happening <laughs> here. So Mike, tell us a little bit about a, uh, a gateway around the moon. That's right. There is a lot of growing interest for the uh, um, uh, what was the Deep Space Gateway, but is now being called the Lunar Orbiting Outpost Dash Gateway. So I don't like that new name for it. <laughs> I don't care for it either. Um, so. <laughs> um, there's a lot of, uh, of, of excuse me. There's a lot of interest that NASA especially has noticed. And uh, Bill Gerstenmaier, uh, he was at a uh, conference in Tokyo earlier this month, the second International Space Exploration Forum, which I'm going to call ISEF2. And while he was there, by the way, Bill Gerstenmaier, he's the Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations. He said that both the International Space Station partners and a bunch of emerging space nations showed interest in cooperating with NASA on plans for the, the Exploration Gateway. At the whole um, forum at ISEF2, uh, it was held on March 3rd in Tokyo, as I said, and leaders of space agencies around the world uh, attended to discuss not only their current uh, plans, but future space exploration plans, and to form new collaborations to explore together. And countries are really interested in cooperating on NASA's lunar exploration plans in a variety of ways. It's all centered around the development of the lunar orbiting platform, which I'm just going to call the Gateway from now on. And <laughs> And it's a facility in lunar in cis lunar space. It's going to be uh, uh, having a kind of a weird orbit around the moon, but that's going to enable a lot of different things. There's a lot of uh, a series of lander missions that would culminate in human missions to the lunar service in the late 2020s, and before that, there's going to be several commercial missions. Uh, before that, but uh, at this particular conference, there was many ongoing projects that were discussed at the ISEF2, including Earth observation and the International Space Station, and how ongoing efforts can be complicated by many, or excuse me, not complicated, but rather complemented, although I, I guess it's complicating it too, uh, <laughs> how different efforts could be uh, added onto by uh, a lot of these new emerging space agencies, such as Poland, Luxembourg, and the United Arab Emirates. One of the areas of cooperation for the future gateway, though, which all these uh, ongoing projects are leading up to, is the development of life support systems. And especially, there was interest from the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency, JAXA. Both agencies have expressed interest in supporting uh, not just developing life support systems, but supporting the communications and enhancing the power and propulsion element, or the service module of the gateway, which is the gold element on the left there. And addition, in addition to this, uh, there's a, a whole bunch of different missions and technologies which countries can cooperate with NASA on. And the ag agency is working to develop standards for deep space technologies. NASA announced on March 5th, just a couple days 
after this, a draft of interoperability standards that the agency and ISS partners have de have already and will continue to develop in areas such as avionics, communications, environmental control, and life support systems, power systems, rendezvous in operations, as well as the robotic and thermal systems that would all be needed in order to make this type of habitat feasible. And another area of interest is, of course, developing lunar lander capabilities. NASA's plans in the near term is to partner with commercial companies to uh, send small commercial landers and ultimately develop larger landers. But there's a few details about how NASA is going to be doing that. There's a couple of small business uh, uh, awards they've been giving out to companies like Astrobotic and even some uh, expressed interest in Blue Origins, Blue Moon program, but nothing has quite yet materialized. And something else that uh, Gerstner Meyer said about uh, all of these different plans is a concern that our partners are kind of worried about our shifting directions since NASA's space exploration plans have shifted so much over the past decade. And this has led some of our partners to consider alternatives. For example, Roscosmos and the Ch Chinese National Space Administration signed an agreement at the same conference, the ISEF-2, where they are agreeing for their intentions for cooperation in the field of lunar exploration and in deep space and in the creation of a data center on all of their different lunar projects projects, which way they would share publicly with the world. Now, although this agreement is specifically for robotic missions, such as the Russian orbital spacecraft Lunar Resource One, or Luna 26, which is launching in 2022, as well as the planned Chinese mission for landing somewhere near the South Pole of the Moon in 2023. This agreement, though, follows on to past agreements that have been set up uh, to have joint ground stations, joint orbital debris tracking, technology transfers, and a whole lot more. All of this could lead both both countries to realizing they're, they're separate, but uh, both of them have ambitions to have human lunar landings, and they might do that together with or without NASA. Something else that I found was really interesting at the uh, ISEF2 conference was uh, the ESA's director, uh, um, Johan Dietrich Warner, and JAXA's, JAXA's president, Noiki Okamura, signed a joint statement detailing their agency's partnership and future collaboration. Both Japan and Europe have a shared vision for space exploration and tend to work even closer on preparing their separate explorations of the moon with uh, all of the different missions that both have planned. So all of these things are kind of forming together in this uh, shift that we've had recently of going back to the moon. A lot of these other countries have been having these plans for many years and sticking to them. And in a way, that was kind of to follow on our plans with the Constellation program that was canceled back in 2005. They never canceled their lunar plans and have been building towards it. So all of these things are coming together and culminating, and I'm really excited for what the future can bring. And I really want to see this outpost, the gateway, be built. So Yeah, me too, yeah. Um, because I feel, like, news. I feel like LOPG uh, could definitely be... Uh, a gateway not just for lunar exploration, but a deep, enabling deep space exploration as well, uh, both from a government standpoint and a commercial standpoint as well, because it definitely can be, end up being um, an enabler for commercial work in cislunar and deep space um, as well. And that, that to me is the most exciting part about it, um, is that. And also a continuous human presence in space would kind of be nice um, as well with that. And really, with all of these uh, these cooperation documents being signed and delivered and everything right now. It kind of reminds me of the early 90s um, after the the fall of the Soviet Union and the beginning of, of uh, Russia uh, kind of coming into the international community and everything starting up, uh, moving from Space Station Freedom to Space Station Alpha to eventually the International Space Station. And that's kind of that's kind of what it feels like right now is we're in that that intro point uh, where it's, it's kind of coming in. So, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, hoping hoping for I agree. Uh, the best time. The best for that. Um, and of course, uh, just want to before we go to break, I just want to uh, mention, of course, that uh, the, the famous cosmologist Stephen Hawking uh, did pass this week, who did an incredible amount of work um, in things like uh, gravitational singularity theorems uh, and general relativity. So uh, it would be remiss of us to not mention that and the incredible work that he was able to do, um, especially with his co collaborations with Roger Penrose. And, uh, and that work. And also, 
the incredible work that he did of popularizing science as well, bringing these incredibly complex ideas and turning them into things that people who aren't scientists can actually digest and understand when they walk away um, from any of the works. Uh, pick up any of his books uh, that he's written. They are absolutely fantastic works, um, and you will, uh, you will have an understanding of the universe uh, that no one thought we would have ever had uh, before he began his work. So we're going to go to a break real quick, uh, and when we come back, we're going to have Neve Shaw being interviewed by our one and only Lisa, who I could see in the window, actual size, right there, um, right there uh, <laughs> talking about arts and humanity <laughs> in space. So stay tuned. There's more tomorrow right after this. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get into our interview for today, I wanted to give a very big thank you to all of the crowdfunding supporters of tomorrow, specifically our Escape Velocity citizens. These are the people that give us $10 per episode on Patreon or $30 per month on Maker Support. But we also have our Orbital citizens. These are the people that give us $5 per episode on Patreon or $15 per month on MakerSupport.com. They get their name in the show during the third uh, and second segment and access to our exclusive citizen only hangout the next of which is on March 25th. So if you'd like to also help support the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro or makersupport.com slash tmro. Now today I'm really, really excited because we have an amazing guest for you all today. We have Dr. Neve Shaw, who is a science communicator and actress from Ireland. She's also the artist in residence at Black Rock Castle Observatory. And she's been the uh, core lecture co-lead for the International Space University's uh, Space Studies Program. And is, was also the humanities department chair for the SSP as well. She's also done two theater shows about space, one of which debuted this week. Uh, and one of which I was also able to go and see myself and it was an incredible experience. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Nee, for being with us today. Lovely to be here, Lisa. Thanks a million for uh, asking me. And of course, you couldn't have picked a better day because it's St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, I've got and the we're live from Ireland. <laughs> Wonderful. I know. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to dive right into, into the why of what you do because you do so many cool, amazing things. Um, so I just wanted to put it straight out there. Why do you think we need the humanities in space exploration at all? Uh, because I guess everything comes from people and all research and all technology and all innovation uh, emerges from the minds of the amazing people involved in space. So sometimes um, those amazing minds can get so scientific that they forget that there's a human being behind it all. And it's very important to bring as many people with us on our amazing journeys of innovation into space. So I kind of fly the flag for the general public and the people that are naturally curious, but may not necessarily have that background in science to be able to keep up with that kind of information. And also, you know, where we're going, if we do become an interplanetary species or we do set up um, a colony on the moon or, you know, a research colony, for instance, uh, it's all about people and it's all about how people interact and how they get along and uh, artists and philosophers and writers and painters and sculptors, they're all skilled about seeing things from a very human point of view. And once you put a community of people together, it's very important to keep that conversation in the room. So I fly the flag for science, but really I fly the flag for the humans behind the science. That's incredible. Uh, we, we've heard all these stories now about uh, well, this kind of push at the moment, this popularity for putting the A into STEM to make it STEAM. So instead of mm. science, technology, yeah. engineering and math, putting the A for arts in there as well. Is that how you bring people along on the story? Is it combining the arts with the STEM? And are you like, obviously a STEAM advocate? Uh, how do we go about, you know, really promoting the A in STEAM? 
Well, I think the A isn't just arts. I think it's I think it's all sorts of pursuits where we're where we kind of analyze ourselves. So I think philosophy should be in there. Um, I think some of the social sciences should be in there. So like that that abbreviation can get very very long. But I guess the A kind of uh, tries to include all of that. And I think it's important because um, it's it's like what I said. I mean, people have skills in lots of different areas and. Maths and science and technology is just one way of seeing a solution to something. And, and once anything involves the progress of our civilization, I think it's very important to always keep that humanities um, mindset in the room. Because don't forget, you know, in the Renaissance period, we had true innovation when philosophers and scientists and artists had those conversations together. So, um, and particularly when we're looking at this next frontier and these next steps in our civilization, it's very important to keep that. And uh, and that, to me, it feels very important for me to keep the general public as informed as possible, because otherwise we're going to have this massive chasm between uh, the informed and the people that understand, uh, you know, this dense language of science and technology. And we're going to remove uh, a majority of the, of the general public who have probably some very interesting ideas and may have something very interesting to contribute. But also... Um, if we're going to do this, it's important for everybody to get on board or for, for everybody to understand the importance of it and for them not to not to think that it's just something that's happening remotely from themselves. Uh, because, you know, we're, we're all from the same planet and we all have to take care of our planet. And every time we leave this planet, we can always learn something about taking care of this one that we're on right now. How do you facilitate those conversations? Like, how do you bring space down to Earth for everybody? How do you make it more accessible? Uh, I try to, um, I always kind of start from myself. I always kind of go, right, okay, so what would that be like if I had to experience it? So what I do is I, I will go and um, meet fascinating people who are doing really, you know, a, a incredible things or they've, they've you know, they're, they're, they're incredible thinkers or they're part of, um, you know, the European Space Agency's research team or um, astronauts or whatever, but they're all, they're all involved in, in space in some shape or form from the science and technology end of things. And I listen to them. And I try to kind of get a handle on how the whole thing kind of works together as a community or and try to find something that's relatable to everyday life, um, you know, because all of us work in groups, all of us work in teams. So if we can make that kind of relationship relatable and find what it is that they're interested in and relate it back to something that's tangible to us in the everyday, then you have uh, you've piqued the interest uh, from the general public because everybody is curious it's about finding the right way to explain it to them that they can understand that so that's the first thing that I do and then I try to find um, really good analogies or metaphors or similar patterns um, that we're more familiar with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and sort of relate them back to that and obviously make sure that that the scientists and the technologists can see that point of view as well because I don't think it's just one way, I think it's actually a two-way conversation. I think it's just as important for science, um, people involved in science, the engineering of, um, and all the technological disciplines of, of space to listen to the humanities end of things and to keep the general public on board because they have as much to learn as the general public have going up and going down. So it's a, it's a two-way thing. And artists and people involved in the humanities are very good conduits for keeping that level and those kind of conversations happening. And is that kind of the, the work that you did as part of um, being the humanities chair for ISU? Is, um, what kind of stuff did you, did you teach uh, during that period? Was it about how to keep those two-way conversations going? Um, well, I'm, I'm co-chair this year on humanities with Ruth McAvinia um, for the Space Studies program. So she's, she's incredible because she's, she's kind of got this background in journalism as well as the arts. So she brings in lots of different aspects so I would be very much um, art focused so I'm coming at it from uh, you know from the from the, the the creative pursuit of trying to understand space but but Ruth also brings in ethics and she brings in um, the bigger conversations um, uh, you know working together with with law and policy and encouraging people to think about communities from lots of different aspects and and space architecture as well so we, we try to have as many activities uh, as possible that, that reach across philosophy, the creative arts, um, ethics um, and, and law and policy in that way in our humanities. And then in terms of my involvement then in core lectures, 
we did the same thing. We tried to bring in um, anthropology into the course um, just to have an idea of us as a, you know, as people, how we change and how we adapt to each new environment and how we can prepare best. We bring in futurists, people who are always thinking about um, predicting and forecasting what's coming ahead in the next 50 to 100 years, as well as architects and then also about communicating and um, then the, the creative arts, which are, you know, the, the, the artists that are responding to space and all the fascinating work that they do and what we can learn from seeing their perspective of space. I love that you combine so many different perspectives and have so many different collaborations with a bunch of different people with mm. ultimately the goal of, yeah. of getting people excited about space. It's something that, that we do here on Tomorrow all the time. Um, that's, that's, that's why we're here. And I think one way that that's come through with you is that you've collaborated with a lot of people for your latest theatre show yeah. that debuted at the Smock Alley Theatre in Dublin this week, A Diary of a Martian Beekeeper. Can you tell me a little bit about yeah. where the inspiration for A Diary of a Martian Beekeeper came from? Uh, conversations. I'm a, I'm, I believe everything comes from talking to people. You know, everything, all, all, all the work that I make, my own personal artwork is always about, it always starts with conversations with people. And I was interviewing some astronauts in 2015 and I found it really interesting that rarely do we hear the kind of the human side of of space exploration a lot of the time you know uh you know people find out about oh what's it like to eat or you know what's it like to go to the loo or what's it like to sleep but but i but like what's it like on the down days you know and, and trying to get to find out from them what that feels like uh, uh as an everyday kind of experience and they kind of inspired me to think about all the different people that contribute to getting them into space and the hundreds and thousands of people that it takes for all space missions. And I became very interested in trying to tell the story of the unsung hero, all of those thousands of people. And I approached the European Space Agency, who I'd worked with before on my previous show to space, specifically uh, people working in the astronaut centre. And um, Jules Grand Sire, who's um, head of communications there at the time, uh, gave me access to, uh, and Aidan Cowley, a researcher there, organised interviews for me to speak to different people working in different aspects at the Astronaut Centre, whether they're involved in future mission planning or um, astronaut training or um, preparing meals for astronauts, as well as all the other um, scientists that I'd, I'd already interviewed at the European Space Agency's Research and Technology Centre. And, and what kind of what, what I kind of observed was that all of them are really passionate about space and really believe in, in future human space exploration and um, investing in our understanding of ourselves in terms of our place in space. And I, I kind of realized that I really wanted to tell that story. And so to take it from a really small level, be one of those thousands of people that contribute a tiny part to this much bigger puzzle of um, space exploration and understanding how we would survive if we were to live, um, uh, you know, as colonies uh, colonies on, on the moon or on Mars. So I set the, the show in the future as if I'm uh, one of those scientists on Mars and I'm part of kind of a team that are going ahead before we have a, a colony of future Martians coming. And I'm conducting research in testing the feasibility of bringing bees to Mars to pollinate plants. And, and that... I did that because it allowed me make a story that was very human and very accessible because it was about the scientist who was really excited about getting her project happening and getting her science and her experiments working, which all which everybody can kind of understand. And but also the distance between her and her family. And she experiences sort of a, a personal struggle that something happens in her family and she's isolated uh, millions of miles, millions of kilometers away from her family. And she has a struggle that every human being understands. You know, everybody understands uh, crises in families and how difficult it is. And in those situations that those hundreds and thousands of people that work in space exploration park their own personal uh, circumstances for the better good of the project and for humanity in general. And so that's the premise of the show. And I, and I hope that I um, honour the many thousands of people that play tiny parts uh, that feed into a much bigger um, issue that gets us to where we want to get to in, in space exploration. What's the reception been like so far? Uh, I think you've had four or five uh, shows this week. Yeah. What's it been like? It, 
It's been brilliant. Uh, we got a fabulous review from a theatre critic uh, yesterday uh, in the Irish Times, which is kind of like the leading kind of um, paper here in Ireland that would review a theatre show. So it, stand, it stood on its own as, as a theatre show and, it, and uh, it genuinely managed to kind of merge those two uh, areas, you know, where science and arts kind of converge, which is kind of the world I live in. And I attract a very uh, unique audience that are people that are interested in, in science, but then people that are just members of the general public that would know me from television and radio. And they kind of trust that I'm this kind of everyday average human being who's having this experience about, you know, um, her own personal uh, project and you know, performance art piece about trying to get to space. So they kind of trust that I will give them a kind of a very human outlook on it. And so that audience came and the response has been really good. And all of them um, finally understand what it's like for somebody working in um, in the space industry. Like these are non kind of science people that it's just like every other kind of job that you have struggles and that it is actually about rigor and about uh, a lot of uh, repetition but it's always ultimately to feed into a much bigger goal. So they all understand that and they all connected with that and they all connected with the with the human aspect of, uh, you know, just being in a family and the struggles that can sometimes happen in that situation and understanding the importance of always trying to get the, the job done. And then through that lens, we can teach them a little bit about space exploration, what's happening at the moment. And also I taught them a lot about, about beekeeping too, which I also learned last year. So I think it was um, of the three shows that I've made so far, far where I'm combining kind of science with um, and telling it through a human story. I feel that it's been the most successful and uh, the reception has been brilliant. So it's great. What was the hardest uh, challenge in terms of, of the development of Diary of a Martian Beekeeper uh, as opposed to your previous theatre show to space? What, what was harder this time around? Well, the previous the previous show to space was about my own personal uh, dream to go to space and where it came from and why I didn't do anything about it and what I'm trying to do about it. So, so it was more of a, 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 a very much a biographical piece. This was a genuine uh, piece of fiction. It was sort of like a, a I would call it kind of meta theatre because it actually mirrors my life a lot, but it's set in the future. So, I would have taken a lot of elements of my life. Uh, in terms of mirroring my own family and uh, my journey so far and, you know, the fact that I've actually learned beekeeping. And the most difficult part of it was, um, I guess, trying to find that that way of, of merging fiction with fact that I, I have... Um, in between each of the scenes, I have videos of different interviews from uh, scientists and engineers working at the astronaut center and also excerpts of interviews from some of the astronauts that I interviewed. And how do you merge those two together? Because I'm not just talking about my life now. I'm trying to serve, I'm trying to serve a story that reflects hundreds and thousands of, of scientists who, who have rigor and repetition in their life every day and their tiny little contribution to a much bigger part of a puzzle is very important to them. So I wanted to honor that. So trying to find the right blend of the story versus the um, the actual uh, data that I had and the actual interviews that I had was, was difficult. And then, um, and also kind of tapping into uh, the personal side of it, like, uh, you know, my parents are still alive and something happens um, during the show. And so it was it was difficult to kind of go right uh, to serve the story. I know I kind of have to up the drama. Um, and yeah, that, 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 that was tough. And it was like trying to figure out how much of that, how much of myself do I share in order to serve the story and how much, how much fiction can, can also kind of get that, that flow in the story happening. But I think we, we got there and, and also it was, um, it was trying to find the right device to get people to think about, you know, the the dignity of being one part of a much bigger picture. And when I was learning beekeeping, uh, and it was totally uh, coincidental that I was learning beekeeping with my father because um, dad is 79. And you never know, you know, you never know, like, how much more we have them. So it was very important for me to learn beekeeping before it, it became too late. So I was just learning beekeeping at the same time that I was interviewing um, all these great scientists and people working at the Astronaut Centre. And I started kind of seeing all these parallels between um, uh, 
between you know space, the whole space um, community and and bees uh, and the fact that you know a, a colony of bees they all work together and there's kind of no one really in charge they all kind of it's a total democracy and I was kind of going you know they're, bees are kind of happy just being having one little job that becomes part of a bigger whole and I would that's kind of the way human space exploration is really you know and, and we we give a lot of um, we give a lot of, of attention to the astronaut, but the astronaut wouldn't get up there without the contribution of all of those thousands of people contributing their tiny piece to the much bigger puzzle. And in the same way, in beekeeping, a lot of people think a hive is all about the queen. And, and the queen has, has a very important role, but she cannot exist without the community of bees. And actually the bees, they're the ones that make all the big decisions. So trying to figure all that out was really difficult. Uh, and then when, once I saw that parallel, I went, I think this is a good device. Um, let's, let's try it and let's see. And and then also then kind of knowing how much of my own personal self to share the story. So, yeah, it was, a, it was many layers, many layers. Now that you're a bee expert in, uh, you know, bees on Mars and bees on <laughs> space, uh, in space, I actually have a question from our chat room that's slightly related to this. Uh, Vogon wants to know yeah. uh, if you know whether bees fly upside down in zero gravity or on Mars. I mean... From your experience with this show, um, what would you what would you say happens to a bee in that kind of environment? That's a really good question. Well, it's it's it, that's really interesting because I actually don't know. That's really good because they probably do have some sort of um, proprioception the same way we do. You know, like so we have our inner ear to tell us, you know, the X, Y, and Z of, of what what way is up, and of course that gets confused once we're in microgravity. So I don't I don't know. I mean. It's also hard to know, you know, when, when we're on Mars, what, what impact like um, a gravity, the existence of gravity being one third that of Earth, would that be enough for, for our own inner ear to understand where we are in, you know, what way is up? And, and I guess whatever would happen to us would probably happen to bees as well. But that's a great question. <laughs> and all the more reason to send bees to Mars. And Definitely. for me to go and do it. <laughs> we should, I, I'm totally down for sending you to Mars with a truckload of bees with oh, you. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to come back to to your thoughts about how much of the personal story to put in to this show, because it is a mix between fact and fiction. Um, but yeah. you're not just anyone making a show about, you know, being an astronaut on Mars. You actually have experience as an analog astronaut yourself. So how much yeah. of your experience through uh, your analog um, missions was put into the show? Well, it was. It, it wasn't supposed. Like when I when I started the project, I, I kind of didn't know what what I was going to use as the device. But actually, the analog mission. I went to the Mars Society's uh, Mars Desert Research Station in in Utah last last winter, and uh, I was with Crew One Seven Three. There was five of us in total, and uh, it's really interesting because that became the backdrop for the story. And so I was part of Crew 173 and two of my crewmates, my actual crewmates, Michaela Musilova and Richard Blake, I gave them lines in the show, which they recorded and they play back to me during the show. So I was completely inspired by it. And it really helped me get an idea of what that sense of isolation is and uh, really set the tone and helped me understand how I can be that solitary uh, scientist that's part of a crew, isolated on, on Mars, uh, millions of kilometers away um, from family and friends and understanding, you know, the ration food, uh, energy, water available and how that keeping people informed is, is vital, you know, with your daily reports and also that you have to put the needs of your crew first before yourself in order to uh, really be uh a very good operating crew, which again reflects back to the bees and the colonies, you know. Wow. That's such I was very inspired by that experience. It's an incredible experience. Um, yeah. I, I was wondering also about um, if, if, you know, there are scientists that's the, watching the show right now and, and they want to take away kind of how they can take their experience with science or with space and, and use that to tell more human stories. Um, do you have any kind of one tip or one piece of advice that you could give to those people watching and how they can kind of humanize their work more and help to inspire more people with it? So the one thing we all have in common is that we're people. So every single person understands what it is to be a person, okay? 
So if you can share more of yourself in your science, uh, you can attract more non-scientists to it. So sharing your failures, sharing your flaws, sharing the things that went wrong, sharing your excitement of when it goes right, explaining what what it's like to um, for you, why, why you do what you do, why it's a passion of yours. All of that uh, gives, gives non-scientists access to the way you think. And, they, and if they can understand why you're passionate about something, they'll get into it too. And I learned that uh, a long time ago when I was sort of a full-time actor and doing improvisation. And, and I teach scientists now how to do that, how to communicate their science by just being, you know, just being people first. And then everybody understands what it's like to be a person and everybody understands what it's like to be curious. And sometimes if the science is very kind of, um, if it feels like very specific or very dense or, or, you know, sort of beyond them, you can bring them in by kind of explaining why it matters to you and why you love it so much. Everybody understands that. That's a wonderful piece of advice. Thank you, Niamh. Um I have another question from the chat room here. Um, so this one comes yeah. from Jared, Jared Head, and uh, they ask, what do you say to folks in STEM fields who often criticise arts and humanities education as unnecessary and wasteful? <laughs> it's like I don't know how to even answer that it's kind of like saying let's drop half of the alphabet you know what I mean it's like <laughs> I mean it's creativity and creativity manifests itself in lots of different ways science is as creative as art is so and artists have every right to take science and technology and be inspired by it as much as they are inspired by nature or by the sea or you know what I mean like the sea is, is part of nature and you can describe it artistically or you can describe it scientifically. The two things uh, are perfectly capable to exist in the same way. And uh, it's okay for scientists to love what they do. That, that's okay. And I, I don't think art will ever infringe on that or threaten that in any way. But artists have the right to look at that science and decide for themselves what it means to them personally, uh, as well as being able to show people another way of seeing it. You know, and I think if scientists, uh, people working in STEM subjects are wise, they should uh, keep an eye out for how artists interpret what they're saying, because it could give them another way in and could help them uh, find a whole other level of innovation or in innovation or uh, eureka moments in what they're doing. It's OK. Not, it's not a threat in any in any shape or form. It's it's actually necessary to be able to see what you do from lots of different viewpoints. And the arts is one way of seeing what you do differently and from the more general public um, point of view. Because we're people, we're people, we're not just minds and brains, we're people first. Everybody understands what it is to be human. So I, they, uh, I love your So even though you're a scientist and, and you love what you do, uh, you're also a person. That's fantastic, that's a wonderful, wonderful way to kind of <laughs> answer that question and I'm definitely going to take a leaf out of your book next time someone asks me why we're putting the A in STEM and and that just is such yeah. a great way of explaining it that makes it more human and more relatable. Um, our, our chat room is loving how you kind of see the connections between all those different perspectives as well um, and with that we have CFIT in the chat room who actually wants to know if they can get a book recommendation for you uh, from you. Not necessarily your favourite book, but just something interesting related to space. So I'm guessing something that tells quite a bit of a human story, but is space related as well. Wow, gosh, that's a good question. It's completely taken me off the... Uh, oh my gosh. Um, ah, so they want to know of a book that you would is... Recommend. What kind of book are they looking for, Lisa? Uh, any any book about space? Yeah, or? just something interesting related to space. Hmm. I think Moon Dust is a is a good one. Um, I I love biography, you see. So I would always try to find um, stories about interesting people. So I recently read a book about the you know the fifty female astronauts. I found that really interesting and how you know how society has really changed in the last fifty years in terms of being able to accept you know, women in space and how, how far it's come. I found that really interesting. I absolutely loved uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's book about astrophysics for people in a hurry. And it's written in a way 
which is quite amazing. It's written in a way for people who don't have that background in astrophysics. And he's able to kind of uh, tell us all about, you know, dark energy and uh, all the all the mysteries that still evade um, some physicists. But he kind of leaves it open for you to kind of think about think about them for yourselves and, and kind of open your imagination. I read that recently. I absolutely loved it. Um, yeah, they'd be kind of my two recommendations. I love that book because it's so thick with you know, with mysteries of, of, of our understanding of the universe, but explained in such an everyday way with fabulous analogies that really fire your imagination. Every chapter kind of leaves you pondering, do you have the answer in it yourself? Which we probably don't. But I love the fact that he can kind of make that available to the general public to think that maybe we can actually unravel those mysteries ourselves. That's yeah, awesome. I'd highly recommend that book. Um, speaking mm. of uh, other interesting people, I have another question here from Sarge Enzyme in the chat yeah. room who asks, would you consider putting mm -hmm. a car in space as art? <laughs> okay, so I think the difference between art and, and just putting a car in space is an artist usually has a, a reason behind something. So they want you to see something differently or they want to provoke a response or they want you to question something. So you can just put a bunch of flowers in space or you could just put a book in space or you could just put a car in space. Um, and if there's an intention behind it, uh, it's artistic. So I guess that would be up to Elon. So my understanding of why Elon did it was that rather than it just being a block of concrete, which is usually the test payload, he wanted to put a car in space. Uh, so in a way, it is, it is a, what I like about it. It does, when you see it, it really does provoke a response in you and it makes you kind of go, what do I think about that? And, and you're, you're trying to kind of shift your perception of, of where a car belongs and the fact that it's not kind of on the streets and it's now in space and it's making its way to Mars. It kind of starts kind of clicking away lots of questions in your head. Um, but I guess uh, it's a very open-ended question. And the kind of art I really like is the, is the art that has lots of different layers to it and makes you question things about yourself and also try to figure out what the artist is asking you to have a think, have, uh, what the artist is asking you to think about as well. And it should provoke a response, positive or negative, for you. And it should also help you see something differently. So I would say, in this instance, to me, that car uh, provokes a lot of thoughts for me and really helps me kind of change my perception of, of where we're going. So I feel it, there is an artistic response in that. Wonderful. Um, so what's next for you, Neve? After uh, you premiered your new show, what are you up to now? Yeah. Uh, okay, well, so I'm off to Japan on Wednesday. I'm going to the uh, conference uh, for communicating um, astronomy to the public to talk about that theatre show. Um, we've got the Space Studies program coming up in the Netherlands. Um, I have some more public events coming up later in the year. So not only do I um, make theatre, but I also make uh, very accessible kind of events for the general public as well as all my radio stuff. And I continue in my pursuit as a live performance artist uh, in genuinely trying to get to space and getting people to come along with me. So I've started my very initial research into the next uh, project, which is going to be a much bigger project to hopefully get the whole world behind me in allowing me see the Earth from a distance in order to get us all start to see our own planet differently and from a more personal perspective that we start to take more responsibility of taking better care of it. So there's a lot going on. <laughs> That's fantastic. You sound super the busy, as well. but yeah. super mm. exciting to see all the new things that you're going to be doing. Um, where can people go to find out more about you and all this amazing stuff that you do? Uh, I have my website, so it's neveshaw.ie. Uh, so Neve is spelled funny. I'm just going to say it now. So it's an Irish name. So it's spelled N-I-A, M for mother, H for hotel, uh, Shaw, S-H-A-W dot I-E. There you go. All right, before we wrap up today, Neve, uh, we have four general questions that we kind of ask all of our guests, just really casual, really fun. Oh, okay. Um, there's no right or yep. wrong answers. Just, uh, just go with what your heart says. Um, so the first one of okay. that is, what is your favorite space mission, past, present, or future? 
Oh, it, it's, I mean, it has to be the moon landings. There's just, you know, it, it happened at a time in my life. I was, um, I was very young, but my dad, um, was working in General Electric and because it was, an, it was an American company, it felt like we were part of the mission. I don't know why. So <laughs> for me, there's something very magical about it and it really shifted our perception of ourselves as human beings, seeing uh, that footprint on the moon. Uh, it's And then future, I'm very excited to see what Elon Musk and SpaceX do in their um, planned interplanetary missions I've, I was very, very, I found that the recent uh, SpaceX mission, you know, the, the, um, the one that happened last month, I, I, I'm still I'm still processing that. And I think that that's going to be a very special um, mission that, uh, you know, seeing those two Falcons landing at the same time uh, really did have a profound effect on me. And I still can't articulate it. So that's percolating. I feel exactly the same way. It's it has not sunk mm, in yet. Mm. Um, that was just mind blowing. I, yeah, I, can, I can't. I yeah. I felt like I was it, watching that was a shape shifter for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. And so if that's what he did, I, I'm very excited to see what he's going to do about getting to Mars. Wonderful. Uh, human or robot exploration of the cosmos? I think human because humans uh, understand when we put ourselves in the lens of something, it has a very different effect than a robot. So it was because we saw a man on the moon that shifted our perception uh, of ourselves. So, I mean, robots will be safer, but I think in terms of us getting a value about being a better species and taking better care of our planet, seeing a human being in a place that we haven't really seen them before can really shift our perception of our relationship with our planet. So I would always say human all the way. Wonderful. And where do you think that we should go next? Well, we're going to the moon. I mean, you know, you saw there, uh, even one of your reporters there, Jan Voner is, is very much behind having, you know, a, a lunar village or a moon village, as he called it. So I think that's definitely going to happen. It's definitely going to happen. And then obviously Mars. Cool. And this is my favorite question. Why space? Why space? Because for as long as we have existed, we have looked to the stars for answers. We have every civilization. The Chinese uh, were the first to map the stars. The Egyptians worshipped the sun. Um, it goes all the way back. Uh, we have constantly shifted our perception of ourselves and our existence when we looked up. Uh, you know, for if you go back, we were heliocentric. We believed that everything uh, orbited around Earth. And then we realized, no, we orbit the sun. And then we realized, oh, we're one of, you know, other planets. Oh, that's right. We're in a galaxy. Oh, there's other galaxies. Um, we've always looked to space for answers about who we are and why are we here. So space provides all those answers and it makes us realize how incredibly small we are. And that's very good for us to consider our own existence and the value of our life and that we only live once and we should live the life that we were destined to have. That's why space. That is an incredibly inspiring, wonderful answer, Neve. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for taking Great. time out of your St. Patrick's Day to, to join us on the show today. We really yeah. appreciate you coming on here. Okay. Um, so we are going right. to take... All right, Thank you. We're going to take a quick break and when we come back, Comments from last week's show. There's more tomorrow coming right up. Science. It both draws us together and tears us apart. Brings discoveries to cure us and threaten us. It is neither good nor evil. It is what we decide to make of it. There is so much more to learn, and we are curious. Together, let's explore the science of tomorrow. And welcome back, everyone. Now, before we get to your comments from last week's show, we want to thank our citizens of tomorrow. We've got our Skate Velocity citizens. These folks give us $10 or more per episode on Patreon or $30 a month or more on Maker Support. And then we've got our Orbital citizens who give us 
$5 or more on Patreon or $15 or more per month on Maker Support. And then, of course, we've got our suborbital citizens as well. These folks give us $2.50 or more per episode on Patreon and $5 or more per month on Maker Support. If you would like to see all of the cool stuff that you get with supporting us here uh, tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro or makersupport.com slash tmro and you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow and help make all of this amazing stuff happen. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's a... Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we thanks, really do. Every and little bit. supporter peoples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every little bit helps. As, uh, as uh, Chris Radcliffe, uh, our wonderful friend, uh, was saying in, uh, in the chat room today, tomorrow, it's worth it. So, <laughs> all right. So, last week's show, we had on Dwight Stephen Bonyecki for the Searching for Skylab documentary, which you can go back to that, sh that episode, uh, episode 11.10, um, and check out the Kickstarter that they have for that to help them out uh, with that. They got a little bit of a boost uh, this past week, but we need to give them a little bit more of a boost because uh, they have some very cool stuff. And we're going to go ahead and start with your comments coming in straight from Reddit with Banana on Mars, which might have to do with bees on Mars um, at some point from today's interview. But nice interview, but it seems the audio dropped out whenever Dwight got too vivid. Is it a possibility to have your interview guests record audio locally in addition to using Skype or else? That would give a fallback, as last time, Dwight had the best video of your interview guests so far. But as Ben says, audio is 80% of a video. Well, Ben's not here, but Ben does say audio is 80%. Oh, no, wait, wait. wait. Yes, he video does. is 80% audio, and mm -hmm. that's that's mostly true. Um, we're working that issue. We have a new Wi Fi system now, so hopefully mm -hmm. that is going to mitigate any of the issues that we had. Yes. Um, but yeah, we're working on it, and thank you for your feedback. Uh, we always try to make the show better, mm -hmm. so that's one way we're, we're improving. Mm -hmm. Even though this is more of a question for Ben, it would be kind of. Um, not unfair, but it would just be too much to ask guests to, to do yeah. that sort of thing of recording yeah. their own audio locally and all that sort of thing. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we also don't know the quality of what the kind of audio that the guest is going to be able to record for exactly. us and things. And also exactly. that's a, a data transfer that would have to happen in order for us to get those episodes to you out on time. And we have a, we have a very well-established workflow that we like um, that allows us to get these episodes on demand to you as fast as possible. So um, we, don't, we don't particularly want to inhibit but that because everybody seems to enjoy that. But we are always open to hearing from our citizens and viewers and other people alike um, as to how we can improve the show because we take your criticisms uh, to heart and really think deeply about them and change things when something isn't working. Um, so just like how we did with changing out the Wi-Fi and uh, with that this week. So um, yeah, good stuff. And, and thank you for being very blunt with us about things that we need to change as well. We're, exactly. We have no problem with being told yeah. what we need to do as long as it's in, in a constructive manner. So, and uh, that's pretty good. All right, go to YouTube real quick. A comment from Arturus P, which is about Orion Space. And they're asking, is Orion Space private? Or does it belong to ESA, the European Space Agency? Because as a EU, European Union citizen, I would expect them to use EU-made rockets, not funding the somewhat unfriendly Russian military complex. Sort of, uh, what, what, yeah. Um, so, Space Mike, I'm, I'm going to throw that one to you since you're our <laughs> rocket expert. Is Ariane Space, uh, does it belong to the European Space Agency? It does not. They are technically a uh, well. I, I think they're a public punk company because I think that there are stocks that exist for them. But yes. they're kind of like the same sort of setup as like Lockheed Martin and, and, and Boeing with uh, United Launch Alliance. United Launch Alliance, even though they build rockets that NASA uses and the American military uses, the American military and NASA do not own those rockets. Lockheed Martin and Boeing do. So the rockets that are built in in Europe that are under the the Arion Space uh, logo are owned by that company. They are a company. And the whole thing with uh, the Soyuz rockets, um, even though I, I completely understand your uh, feelings of, of nationality there, um, that was set up through the company International Launch Services, which markets the, the Proton and now Soyuz internationally. So that was a deal that they set up, and there were some modifications that were made to that so they could launch from French Guiana and all that. Um, but I think that it's kind of cool, and even though I might not have like a 
uh, you know, I, I, I personally feel like I'm a citizen of the world and seeing the, the Russian rockets, like it was, this was an argument that we had a couple of years ago, not an argument, but you know, whether or not to count those launches from uh, French Guiana of the Soyuz as a Russian launch or a European launch. And eventually we decided to call them Russian launches because they're still manufactured in Russia and Russian engineers work on it. But I mean, technically at least part of Russia is in Europe. So, I mean, that could still count as a European launch. So. Yeah. I don't know. I, I understand your feelings, though, but the short answer is Arion Space is a company, and they own the Arion rockets and the Vega rockets. Yeah, so. just a consortium of all these companies coming together with, with Airbus being the biggest, uh, I guess, per stakeholder, if you will, um, with that, both Airbus in France and Germany uh, with that there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, very, very cool. There's your answer, Internet. Ask and you shall know from Space Mike and his mighty, mighty knowledge <laughs> that he has of the rocket <laughs> industry. So. Uh, which it's incredible how much you know Space Mike. I'm always blown away. I I I personally think I know a lot about rockets, but then Space Mike comes in and and blows me away with the stuff he knows. So we got another uh, <laughs> comment from YouTube from a one star citizen speakeasy. Where is this? I want to go and know, right? get some get some drinks. Uh, so there, it looks like this is a two parter here, um, which is wouldn't it be better to use remaining booster fuel to take it out to space if SpaceX knows it can't be landed? Then the space stranded booster could eventually be repurposed in space. I think they're asking could the first stage yeah. of a of a Falcon Nine that is being expended uh, can't they just burn all the fuel so that it will go to space? Um, and then the second part of that question is if a booster gets wasted isn't SpaceX losing a lot of money due to the pricing the due to pricing the flight based on reusability and who covers this cost SpaceX who wants to handle this one anybody want to handle it <laughs> I, well, uh, well, the here, first I can tackle at least question. the first part of that yeah okay yeah, go you go go Mike. you're the rocket specialist I'm gonna throw this one yes, to Mike go for it <laughs> um, well, uh, maybe. I mean, they. I guess they could potentially do that, although the first stage with the second stage and payload on top probably wouldn't reach all the way into orbit. Mm -mm. Um, but then they'd have to have all sorts of different hardware, like if they wanted to reuse it, you know, would that be as like a fuel depot to go up and just, uh, you know, try to suck out whatever fuel is left in there or try to fuel it up some more and have a fully loaded first stage in orbit? Like, you know, there's a whole level of complex that's added to that and what SpaceX usually does is when they know that they're gonna have to expend a rocket uh, that's the payloads that they'll have the heaviest ones on so you know there's a certain weight class that Falcon 9s and now Falcon Heavy could launch with in the expendable version but uh, they usually will do lighter payloads so that they have enough fuel left over to, to do all of this reusability and even with the reusability it's still around the same weight a little bit more weight than just the block one version of Falcon 9 so as far as the customer is concerned you know it's still the same class of rocket so when, instead of doing uh, uh, what you're suggesting of, of having a first stage in orbit they just use up all of that extra fuel for a heavier payload that they know it's going to be an expendable mission on. Mm -hmm. Although this kind of uh, this is all brought up, I'm, I'm guessing by the last mission where even though. Um, they didn't use up all the fuel. They still did all of the regular landing operations they normally would have, but there wasn't a landing ship to go and recover it. But yep. that all kind of has to do with uh, their phasing out of the older versions of Falcon 9 uh, to in preparation for the Block 5 version that's going to be coming out. And I guess that kind of, um, to answer the second part of this question, yeah, it is SpaceX that's uh, eating that cost. And... I mean, that's okay. I mean, they, they've... I mean, every other company right now so is also eating costs, like, for not reusing their... Oh, yeah. Away, yeah. So. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and they kind of... Uh, if, if, if... Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Go for it. I, just just the analogy was is like if if let, let's say the Atlas V was reusable at least the first stage of it and United Launch Alliance started ch charging a much lower price for it because it's reusable than what they normally do for the Atlas V and then had an expendable Atlas V and still charged the reusability price so that difference there yes I guess SpaceX is eating that cost but I mean even the expendable version of Falcon 9 was 
close to around the same price. We haven't actually seen the price go down uh, a whole mm -hmm. lot yet since uh, reusability has been achieved, at least at the first stage. So yeah, and I would say that the key to reuse the key to reusability is not just flying your first stage two to three times. You need to be able to fly that first stage a hundred times in order for that cost to come down. Mm -hmm. um, so really, the true kind of reusability uh, that 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 has to occur in order for the cost to come down, I would argue hasn't actually been demonstrated yet. Uh, the idea of reusing your first stage has been demonstrated, but the ability to demonstrate the reusability uh, to bring down the cost has not been demonstrated yet. And I, I mean, I'm not trying to move the goalposts here. I'm just trying to be a little bit realistic about it because I have no doubt that they're going to be able to do that. Um, but I, it's just nitpicking from terms of engineering and things like that is that when it's, uh, it's really with it there. Um, so yeah, and also uh, kind of to piggyback on what you said, Space Mike, about they still, even with, uh, was it Hispasat, I think, that there was the one that was expendable, right? Mm -hmm. um, even with that, um, they still did the landing, and if you want as much data as you can, especially when this is, uh, when you can do stuff that's very critical to your profiles of landing a vehicle on Mars, because when the, fa when the first stage and second stage of the Falcon 9 uh, separate, that's very similar, um, similar to that, um, that environment you have when you're actually landing on Mars. That's really important data, and you want that, because if you're going to enable a large-scale human colonization on Mars, you kind of got to figure out how to, you know, make that happen. And uh, and as we have seen uh, throughout the history of exploring Mars, um, getting there, not a little difficult. Landing there, though, very difficult, um, as I always like to put out. The only people that have actually landed anything on Mars that has successfully operated for the amount of time that it should is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in L.A. So, um, <laughs> But I'm hoping that we get to add more to that um, during the next launch window um, in uh, 2020. So should be very, very cool. All right, heading back. Yes, cross your finger, cross everything. Um, so um, <laughs> so uh, let's head back to YouTube and get some questions answered here from your comments, which this one is Yiglik uh, Pers Facetious. I, that's, that's how I'm going to say it. Uh, how does the O3B system compare to the test sats that SpaceX launched? So I guess they're talking about the O3B communication sats uh, that were launched on that Soyuz compared to the Starlink yep, satellites Starlink. Uh, that flew on that test mission out of Vandenberg um, there. So how do, how do they compare? Is there is there a comparison going on there? Because I think one... Well, one's uh, a test satellite and one's not a test satellite. So yes, that's the that's first a, difference. First and most obvious. <laughs> yeah. uh, one's for testing, one's for actual use. Um, so if you will with that. So... Yeah. Any? Are there any bigger differences between that? I, I don't know because I don't know because I haven't seen what the capabilities are of those test satellites. Mm -hmm. I mean, SpaceX has said They're what the eventual hot. Starlinks are supposed to be capable of, but I haven't seen any information as to what these test satellites are capable of. So I mean, we, we didn't even really know if they made point. contact with the Starlink satellites, right? They haven't put any press release out or anything that says like, yeah, cool, we like make contact with Starlink A and Starlink B. So for all we know. Maybe they might not have even work. worked, mm -hmm. right? Uh oh, oh. Right? I feel <laughs> yeah. like if it worked, they would have put a press release out. So. Wow. Um, yeah, I think they did mention that they were talking with the two oh, satellites, cool. right. um, and I think that was kind of mentioned in passing. It wasn't like it wasn't like, "Hey guys, we're talking to the set." It was more like, <laughs> "Yeah, we're talking to him." So, um, but I haven't heard anything beyond that. So. Um, yeah, not much news on that front. So, but we'll find out. We'll keep our ears peeled. Yes, we will. We'll keep our eyes and ears peeled. <laughs> yeah. So, our eyes peeled and our ears open. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> our final comment comes off of YouTube as well from Francisco Pinto, which says, "Just want to say that it was much better with Athena speaking." in a slower pace. Good job. Bear in mind that for a lot of the international viewers that English isn't the native language, it becomes difficult to understand when you talk like you're chatting in a bar. It is a great show, nevertheless. And uh, yeah, that's something I always try to keep in mind um, when we're doing this show is that we actually have a really big, I mean, I would say just about half of our audience is our international viewers. We kind of have, we kind of have an almost 50-50 split between just here in the United States and, uh, and a consortium 
podium of international viewers Ooh, um, no. with that there. So it's it's always interesting that we get to sort of uh, talk to a group of people that we don't or reach a group of people that we regularly don't get to um, experience in person, which is fantastic. That's one of my favorite things about space flight, which is that it, in space and space sciences, um, is that it brings everyone together in order to work under uh, under a umbrella for a common goal, um, and that's what's always fantastic to me, and I really uh, I really like it. And uh, and I just saw Athena uh, checked in in the chat room, just saying that she loved the comment um, and that she loves you guys. So there you go. I know so. for me at least. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Uh, you first. I was going to say, uh, I know that when I get really excited, I really start to talk really, really fast. Mm -hmm. But I understand that, yeah, people that don't have English as their first language, it's it's not that they can't hear what we're saying or understand the words, but it's just that the space between the words are too It are just small, mushes all together. So it all becomes one word. <laughs> one and, giant word that lasts for about five minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and here at Tomorrow, I think, you know, we're really, like, wanting to be inclusive to everyone that yeah. enjoys or is interested in space, not just you know, and native English speakers. So yeah. being uh, reminded to slow down is really, really helpful. Yeah. And I'm like really glad that we had this comment because now I'm focusing on slowing down my words uh -huh. so that, you know, people can understand what I'm saying. Because at the end of the day, they need to hear what we're saying so that we can get people excited exactly. about space. Mm -hmm. And like like you said, like we get so excited and then we get, you know, we love you guys so much that it kind of is like, we, you know, we're, we're talking in a bar like, oh God, he's got to show you something, you know, I got to talk to you. But then it's like, wait, you're, you're, you're on camera. Like, you know, people are watching, you need to speak at a certain, you know, cadence. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's hard, it's easy to forget that when you get so excited, like, like you said. And if you're anything like me, like I end up speaking in different voices when I get really excited. So it's like, I could be like five different people and it's a little disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard anybody make comments about that yet, so. <laughs> yeah. What were you yeah. going to say, Mike? Yikes. <laughs> uh, just, you know, I want to say, you know, that both Athena and Jade have been doing a great job because it's oh, hard yikes. being a presenter like yep. this. And even though mm -hmm. I've been doing this for a couple of years now, I still trip myself up. I mean, even just today when I was doing that Lunar Gateway story, you know, I, I started, I tripped over something and then just, just had struggled to recover and be able to speak concisely and clearly. And yes, it is hard sometimes when you, when you are speaking mm -hmm. passionately and get excited about something to calm down and to still mm -hmm. speak clearly and, and at a normal level. So um, it's there's a lot of pressure, though. It's weird. <laughs> like, even though yeah. I've been doing this for a while, I still get, like, butterflies and get nervous before the shows and everything like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank um, you. And people say that I have a very heavy accent, like, like Californian accent, and I have no idea what, what? you what you dudes are talking about? So uh, I, 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 I don't know. Everybody, every everybody I talk to is just like I can tell you're from California just by the way you talk, and I'm like, okay, all right. So I don't, I don't know what that means, but I'll take it as a compliment. Just do your Harry Carey impression. Hi hey, everybody, welcome to tomorrow. We're gonna talk a little bit about space. We're gonna get into, we're gonna talk about hot dogs in space. And if you put them in a bud, well, they stay in the bud. You need the mustard and ketchup there in order to keep it. Oh, what and about how, do you, how do you keep your Budweiser cold when you go to the moon? <laughs> so yeah, I guess that's one of those um, that we can do. Um, but I also just want to say to everybody that you know. Um, and our tomorrow viewers as well, which is that we've really been like kind of kind of a revolving door of people for the past couple of, of you know for about a, the past month, because yep. um, we're kind of just we're kind of throwing everybody in, giving everybody experience so that way we can all get a little bit better at certain things, and we're seeing how people do in certain areas, and okay, they're comfortable here, and they're they're okay, they're maybe they're not comfortable here, and other things like that, um, and I just wanted to give a huge shout out to everybody here at tomorrow that you guys have been doing great. I also want to give a huge shout out to our Tomorrow viewers too, that you guys have been so receptive to this and really enjoying this because it really helps us out, um, in, especially in the feedback and what we're understanding. You know, if you ever have feedback, go ahead and put it there. We're going to listen to it um, and we're going to we're going to see if we go forward with it or not. That's ultimately up to us. Uh, but. I, I mean, our our viewership and our community of tomorrow is an incredible yeah. group of people um, because in most circles on YouTube, it's not really all that great. Uh, but our 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 viewership is just absolutely fantastic. Um, probably one of the most civil I've seen on yep, the definitely. internet. One thousand percent. Is like, <laughs> it, that is a testament to you, oh, all man. of you who are amazing yes. at doing things like that. Um, and yeah. speaking of people who are amazing. 
let's throw it to our ground support citizens. These folks. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, these folks. I'm going to do something after this. Sorry, Detta. Uh, but our ground <laughs> support citizens, they give us a dollar uh, or more per episode on Patreon or one dollar a month on makersupport.com. And of course, you get your name here. You get early access to After Dark and you get ex exclusive access to our citizens only hangouts as well. And I love that this is, we've got so many people in ground support that we have to have your name Lily Itty Bitty there and we have to have two pages <laughs> today to do that too. So get your permanent marker out and circle it on your screen um, with what you got right there. <laughs> and we do want to let folks know that we do have a, uh, a comment uh, from Dwight who, uh, Dwight Stephen Bonyecki, who's doing the uh, the searching for Skylab thing, which is that they're going to be doing a live Kickstarter uh, hangout tomorrow at 1800 UTC, um, which I'm, when this gets posted, I assume that will mean today. Uh, they're hopefully going to have Herb Baker, uh, whose mom sued, sued, sewed, excuse me, <laughs> uh, they sewed the Paracel that helped save Skylab. They're also going to have Janet Gibson, the daughter of Ed Gibson, uh, Brian Fiore, the artist, and Sean Barron's singer-songwriter of the Tencent James, who did the theme song uh, for Searching the Skylab. So join us, and your help on Kickstarter will allow them to do that. So look for Searching for Skylab on Kickstarter, um, because we definitely want to fund that, because Skylab is sort of one of those, it, 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 not sort of, it is one of those ultimately important missions. We learn so much from it, and we don't talk about it enough. And it's so important to keep all of these stories preserved, like we talked about with Dwight. Dwight on the show last week. Now, speaking of things coming up, I was about to say, you want to take it? Take it if you want it. Well, I'm it's gonna, yours. I was gonna mention, Have it. I don't want it so. anymore. I was gonna mention <laughs> our crowdfunding citizens, our supporters. We actually have a uh, citizen hangout coming up on not tomorrow, but the Sunday after, the 25th of mm -hmm. March at uh, 1800 UTC, showtime again. Mm -hmm. So if you are a citizen, don't forget to come and tune into that. We've got some really cool yeah. behind the scenes stuff that we want to share with you. Ben's really excited for it. He's not here, so I have to be the excitement. Yes. <laughs> so, or if you aren't a citizen, become a citizen between now and then. And then and you get to experience it. be able it. to experience yeah. it. So. Join the party. But what's happening next week, Jared? I'll tell you what's happening next week. We have Dr. Chris McKay from the NASA Ames Research Center here in California talking about the search for life in our solar system and the wonders of Enceladus, which, Jade, your news, maybe Dr. Chris McKay will be talking about that. That would be spectacular. That would be amazing. Fantastic. So that's it for Orbit 11.11. .11. Ones is ones is, yep, 11s is all around. So After Dark is up next, and if you're watching live, you know, stay tuned. Tuned. But if you're not watching live, uh, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye, bye bye. Thanks for having me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>